this team created, built, and sold a $220 million company in only 13 months, seizing on a now obvious solution to a problem which everyone has and nobody knew how to solve. Spoiler alert, they were not indie hacking. Here's what they did, how they did it, and what's next. Enter Warpstream. Warpstream is the brainchild of two ex Datadog engineers, Richie Artul and Ryan Worrell. And they've got all of this wealth of Kafka experience, and they turn that around and realize that they could create a binary drop-in Kafka replacement, which uses no local disks. The benefit there is you get a 5x or 10x cost improvement on running Kafka clusters, and it comes at the cost of a little bit of latency. Let's see how they did it. Now, if you've never heard of Kafka before, that's fine. You can sort of think of it as a pipe connecting two services or more accurately, multiple processes from service A or service B. And the design goals of Kafka are kind of simple. It's three things. It's meant to be scalable, it's meant to be fault tolerant, and it's meant to be high throughput. And the basic idea is that any number of producers can write data to Kafka and know that once that write has succeeded, it's persisted and it's durable. So if that producer dies, that data is already written and it's safe. And similarly, the consumers know that they have a cursor they can read data from from this log. And if they have to restart their process or if that process dies, they can just pick back up where they left off and that data is safe. And that's the idea. Basically, any place in the systems or distributed systems ecosystem where you're going to have two services talking together asynchronously, you can find Kafka. And that's my point. Kafka is used basically everywhere. I mean, look at this powered by page they have on their website. These are a bunch of different brands you know and use every day. I mean, Airbnb, Amadeus, if you've ever booked a flight, they're responsible for that. Kafka underpins all of these high throughput services and all of this data processing that goes on in the background of any asynchronous process for a service that you, you probably use and you probably love. It is everywhere. And that's what Warpstream realized. Kafka is also not cheap to run. Looking at this graphic from the Warpstream team, you can see that like a typical Kafka deployment is going to be spread over multiple availability zones in a region. And that's for a good reason. The idea behind highly available software services is that one of those buildings, one of those data centers that AWS runs your software in can burn down and you don't want your application to crash as a result. The idea here is that any write is going to be durably persisted from two of the three availability zones every time you produce to it. But that comes at a cost. AWS is going to bill you two cents per gigabyte for each of those writes on top of just running the services themselves. Just communicating across those availability zones is an extremely expensive endeavor. This is something that Corey Quinn and the Duckbill Group point out over and over and over again, that inner AZ networking quickly becomes the dominant cost for large scale distributed systems. And they're right. Kafka is also not cheap to run. What anyone running a large cluster will tell you, and the Warpstream people figured out, the actual hardware running your clusters is cheap compared to the network bills you're going to get when you're running a large scale cluster. In this case, they're talking about a one gigabyte per second cluster. And let's take a look. You can see if you're self hosting Kafka, according to their information, you're going to spend $223,000 a year on hardware to run one gigabyte per second for a year. But on networking fees, you're going to spend $1.7 million a year. And that's for self hosting. If you're using some managed cloud provider and they don't name it here, it looks like it's closer to 400 K a year for the hardware, but $5 million a year for the networking fees. So what did the Warpstream team do to avoid these cross availability zone replication fees? Well, it's pretty simple. They stuck it in S3. This is the genius play that allowed them to build a binary drop in Kafka replacement that runs at 5x or 10x less cost than normal Kafka. They just store those bytes in S3. Now, S3 already replicates your data across and around the availability zone. It does that for you. So they're able to effectively sidestep those charges and hand that back to customers in a massive, massive cost savings. And that's a pretty big win, especially when you're talking about data at scale year over year, month over month. It's a huge amount of money they can save just by writing to Blob Store. And this is true in AWS and it's true in GCP as well. All right. So the first genius thing they realized is that a good chunk of Kafka workloads are not necessarily latency sensitive. The second thing they figured out is that they could use S3 to end run the cross AZ networking charge, which Amazon and other clouds assess on replication across availability zones. But the actual really genius play for Warpstream as a product is the third thing, which is bring your own cloud. What they realized is that they could build a product where no customer data left the customer's AWS account 
but they didn't necessarily have to turn to open source. So they built this system where Warpstream agents will persist and write data to S3, and then on the consumer side, they'll pull and read data from S3. But all of that data in S3 is fragmented. It's split up, it's batched, it's grouped, it's mixed with a bunch of other data from a bunch of other topics or partitions. What addresses that data, the metadata, which actually makes sense of that information, that's what gets written out to Warpstream's cloud or Warpstream's product. This is what makes it hard to clone or hard to copy or hard to just run it as open source. Even though the agent source code is presumably available somewhere and you can read it, that actual metadata is being stored in their own account and that's where it's persisted, which means that it's really, really easy as a customer to adopt because I know that my sensitive data will never leave my own account. It solves a ton of problem with procurement, with security, with compliance. But at the same time, it positions Warpstream in a place where they don't have to play that OSS game that a lot of other companies like Elasticsearch or MongoDB have had to play where they have a license and they maybe have to relicense their product because the cloud provider is offering their own flavor of it. It's not super clonable. I think that specifically is the genius part about Warpstream. Combine that with the S3 storing and running around AZ thing, saving all that money, five or 10x improvement. It's a really big win. And it's no doubt why Confluent paid so much money to acquire them. Now, this design isn't perfect. It comes with one really big drawback, and that is latency. Writing data to S3, durably persisting it, and then reading it out of S3 on the other side for the consumers isn't necessarily fast. In this blog post, they talk about the P99 latency of about a second, P50 about 582 milliseconds. It's not bad, but it's not great. And I think what they're realizing is that not everyone needs that super, super low latency Kafka experience. They found, and I think what everyone sees in retrospect is that Kafka users sort of have a bimodal distribution. On the one side, it's probably a bunch of people doing clickstream data with super low latency and they need answers right away. And on the other side, they may be aggregating logs or processing analytics or doing something that doesn't really matter if the P99 goes up to a second. The cost is the big driver here. And that's the first key takeaway from Warpstream as a business. They found a really good leverage point here where they could cut off half of the use cases of Kafka and make it five or 10x cheaper. That's super attractive. Now this design not only solves some of the problems that open source has had going to enterprise SaaS, but it also opens the door to a whole group of other applications which can be launched in a BYOC format, potentially using something like S3 to avoid this inter-AZ networking fees. It also potentially can lead companies like Amazon or GCP to drop their internal networking costs across AZs as well. There's a whole bunch of options for different products which can come out of this, and I think Warpstream is just the first. And that leads me to my final thought. The Warpstream team were able to identify such an obvious gap in the existing Kafka ecosystem, and they were able to build a company around it and scale it from nothing to being worth $220 million to Confluent in only 13 short months. All that kind of makes me wonder, what did you do this year? I hope that you liked this video. If you did, hit the like button and consider subscribing, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.